Good morning, everyone. I invite you to take your Bibles. Join me in 1 Corinthians. Well, we will spend most of our day in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the second half, verses 17 through 34. Start in chapter 3, verse 2. It's always good for the people of God to open up the Word of God and receive instruction. Grass and flower will wither and fade, but the Word of God will live forever. So this is time well spent. And we've found ourselves now deep into this epistle, this letter from Paul to the Christians living in Corinth. And we have seen a church with many, many issues. It's quite a challenge for Paul to teach what is now becoming increasingly clear is a dysfunctional church. And we've seen each week that they struggle and they have many forces working against them. First, we see the cultural influences. They come out of a pagan culture, a hedonistic culture, a prideful culture, and understandably so. They are prideful because they live in a city that is an economic power, and they live in a city that's a political power. And they are quite proud of it. And they have come to Christ. And they are hanging on. In some cases, too tightly. In all cases, without much inspection, to old ways that are incompatible with their new life in Jesus Christ. And Paul is having to correct them. We also see that they are immature, and he addresses their immaturity in chapter 3, verse 2. He said, I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you were not yet able to receive it. Indeed, even now you are not yet able. A sad commentary on their spiritual health or lack thereof, that they are not able to take the meat. And that immaturity is showing itself in many, many ways. Right off the bat, in chapter 1, verse 11, Paul points out the divisions and the quarrels among them. He says, For I have been informed concerning you, my brethren, by Chloe's people, that there are quarrels among you. And later he refers to their strife and their division. And some are followers of Apollos, and some of Cephas, and some of Paul, and others claiming, well, we are of Christ. They are divided. They are not unified. They are not of one mind. They are not of one purpose. They don't have one heart. And Paul is coming along beside them with the heart of a teacher, and he's correcting them. And he's had quite a few corrections, hasn't he? this were an English essay, it would have quite a bit of red ink on it, wouldn't it? They are suing one another. They are unrepentant of sin and they will not discipline sin. They are making conclusions about marriage and singleness that are improper and they are abusing their liberties and a lack of order between men and women. And of course, the first casualty of all this is the gospel, the declaration of Christ and him crucified. The stakes are incredibly high and they are fumbling the ball. It appears on just about every play. The stakes are high, aren't they? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2. He reminds them of He's trying to refocus them on what matters. 
And he says, For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. The declaration of Jesus Christ and His atoning death as not just a means to salvation, but the only means of salvation. And that is just getting lost in the trivia that is dividing them and taking up all their emotional energy as they wander in a dysfunctional way away from the target. And now we're seeing as we get deeper and deeper into 1 Corinthians that it's not just the gospel. The gospel is being trampled, but the gospel is being trampled and lost and neglected and you can't see it because of the fog that surrounds this church. And they are really slipping into gross sin. Chapter 8, verse 12. He points out to them to get, I guess, to get their attention, or it should get their attention. It should sober them up. And thus, by sinning against the brethren and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. What a horrible charge. What an awful, awful charge. And today in chapter 11, we'll see a charge against them that is equally sobering and equally awful. Look at chapter 11, verse 27. And we're going to read all of 17 through 34, but I just want you to see the stakes. What is at, what is at stake here? He says, therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup, talking about the Lord's Supper, of the Lord in an unworthy manner, and here it is, listen to this carefully, shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Gross iniquity now just grips them. So we've seen a lot of flashpoints as we've made our way to chapter 11. And now we have a new flashpoint. A new flashpoint where their disorder and their factions and their division and their lack of submission to Jesus Christ and their lack of elevation of the gospel above all is leading to a dishonoring of communion around the Lord's Supper. Chapter 11, verse 17. Starts with this word of contrast. But, he's about to contrast from what we talked about last week. About the discussion about women in submission to the order of the church. And quite frankly, he was, he was kind of commending them a bit on that. He was kind of pleased that they were following certain traditions and practices of local churches but in this area, he is not uh, so kind. This is much more harsh. He says, but in giving this, now this is a pronoun, it's a demonstrative pronoun, and in this particular instance, it points to what is about to come. He's finished his instruction concerning what we read last week, and now he's shifting gears. But in giving this instruction, talking about what's coming up in verses 17 through 34, I do not praise you because you come together not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that divisions exist among you. And in part, I believe it. For there must also be factions among you in order that those who are approved may have become evident among you. Therefore, when you meet together, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in your eating, each one takes his own supper first, and one is hungry and another is drunk. What? Listen how stunned he is by this. What? Do you not have houses in which to eat and drink? Or do you, not, or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? In this I will not praise you. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. 
For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself. And so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick and a number sleep. But if we judged ourselves rightly, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord in order that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home so that you may not come together for judgment. And the remaining matters I shall arrange when I come. Well, this is quite a flashpoint. And it's a flashpoint that he is going to address, not just in chapter 11, but in chapter 12, in chapter 13, in chapter 14. And the focus is on their public gathering as Christians in the name of the Lord. The focus here cannot possibly be missed. Look at verse 17. He says, when you come together, this is about their gathering. Verse 18 he also says there early on in that verse, when you come together, this is all about their public gathering. Verse 20, when you meet together. Verse 33, so then brethren, when you come together. And then finally, verse 34, he mentions again, they're coming together, their public gathering as Christians. And later on in 1 Corinthians, he gives us a little bit of insight into how and when and where this is happening. In chapter 16, verse 2, he mentions that it's on the first day of the week that they are to set aside a time for collections to be made there for the poor. So the first day of the week for us is Sunday. Calendar's probably shifted a little bit since then, but it's the first day of the week. Where are they meeting? Verse 19. Stay in chapter 16. Go to verse 19. Where are they meeting? The churches of Asia greet you. Aquila and Priscilla greet you hardly in the Lord with the church that is in their house. Not uncommon for churches at this time to start meeting in homes. And they would often do it in whoever had the largest house. It's kind of a practical side to this, right? You have a member who has a larger house can hold a much larger group. And they would gather there. And those homes, and especially in Corinth, were designed, uh, you know, they don't have the kind of kitchens that we have today. <laughs> you know, they don't have a refrigerator. They don't have a gas stove or electric stove or an oven. Uh, the, there was probably an eating area that was rather small. And that would have been the main dining room, for lack of a better word. And then off that was a, a sort of what we would think of as the living room. And there might be a study off of that. And so when they came together, they literally couldn't all be in the same room. And so you can imagine what began to happen. Everybody wants to be at the table. I remember it when I was 12 and I was on one side of my family. I was about midway of the grandchildren. About half my cousins were older than me and half my cousins were younger than me. And, you know, I didn't get to sit at the big people's table. I was at the kids' table. I think I, I think I stayed there till I graduated from high school. <laughs> and you can see how that creates factions and cliques. I mean, think about it. We all like to sit in the same place every Sunday. And some would show up early. And they weren't going to wait for others. And they wanted the seats where the main action was happening. And others are in a room where maybe you could look and see what was going on as they were breaking the bread and sending it around and passing into the next rooms. And maybe you were so far away, you could, just, you could just barely hear what was going on. And so there was this room of honor. And then there was the secondary room and then maybe the tertiary room. And it was just, you could just see how these factions would naturally develop. And of course, because they didn't have refrigerators, because they couldn't easily prepare huge meals, as we're going to see in a moment, and they were having a meal. Uh, the, they had a name for it in the Greeks. They, they, they loosely translated, it would be called a basket dinner. So you would call a party. You, you announce to your friends you're having a party, and you would say, well, it's a basket dinner, which means bring your food. 
bring something to eat and bring it in a basket. And what was ex pretty normal at the first century AD is they had a time they called first tables and then they had a time they called second tables. And during first tables would be the people who would arrive kind of early. You know who you are, you folks that come early. Well, they wouldn't wait. They would sit down, open up their basket dinners, and they would start eating. And then there would be this time later where there would be basket dinners, or later, the later arrivals, and they would come in, and they would be what was called second tables. And then they would begin eating. So they're almost eating in shifts. And this is what they had always known. And quite frankly, if you were in the slightly upper class, the more economically rich, uh, you were used to taking your meals before the lower classes. They served you. And then after you were done, they cleared it away, and then they ate. And Paul's about to take them to task on this, saying this is not the Lord's Supper. This is your supper. This is how you do supper. This is not how the church does supper. And he is going to command them to wait and quite frankly to do it much differently than they have ever done it before. And so let's talk about a few things. Number one, we're going to talk about the institution of the, the institution of the Lord's Supper itself and its importance and its purpose. And why would Paul want to insist that it be do, done a certain way? And then we're going to look at, upon, upon, at a hit closer at his rebukes. Why are they, how are they messing this up? How are they failing to really partake of the Lord's Supper? And then he tells them how to fix it. He tells them exactly what they should be doing. And this is a real challenge for us because you know what? A week from today, we will gather for the Lord's Supper. What a great thing to be able to spend the next week thinking much more deeply, maybe than we've ever done before, about how we will gather a week from today to come around the Lord's Supper and do it in a way that is honoring. Because right now, this is shameful. This is shameful. So let's talk about the institution itself. And he, he reminds them of the institution of the Lord's Supper. This is a public gathering. It's probably happening on Sunday. It's probably happening on the evening. It's probably happening in someone's home. And he reminds them of what the Lord's Supper is all about. Verse 23, he says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You can find this moment in Christ's life, the, the last supper, the night before he is killed, in Matthew 26, Mark 14. Luke 22, and he is recounting the night where Jesus did something quite remarkable. He took the Passover meal. He took a meal that had been instituted by God through Moses in the book of Exodus, chapter 12, several thousand years before, and he is going to take that meal and he is going to completely co-opt it for his purposes. He's going to give it a slightly different focus, although similar. He's going to take it and turn our attention on something a little bit like the Passover, but much richer in its implications. And he is going to take that meal and he is just going to co-opt it, take it over and present it back to them as something with a grander purpose. So just to kind of highlight this, I've put in my notes for you kind of a side-by-side -side comparison of the Passover and the Lord's Supper. And you're going to see some slightly different elements, but you're also going to see some very similar elements. 
First of all, the Passover meal took place as the children of Israel are on the eve of deliverance. God has been crushing Egypt slowly, step by step, to demand that they let his people go. That Pharaoh release the Hebrews and allow them to return to the promised land where they will worship the Lord their God. And Pharaoh does not want to let go. He wants to keep them in bondage, slavery. And on the eve of their release, in the grandest punishment of all, God sends the destroyer into Egypt to kill the firstborn in every house. And on the night of that, the people are told to prepare a meal. They are told to take a lamb. In fact, they were told to set the lamb aside several days in advance. Listen to the requirements of the lamb. The lamb had to be a male. The lamb had to be in the prime of its life, so about a year old. It's reaching that maturity where it's kind of entering into adulthood. It's not a babe anymore. It must be unblemished. In other words, it must be their best lamb. No marks. When they kill it, they are told to kill it at a very specific hour. They are told to take it at that hour and they are to kill the lamb. And then they are to take the blood and they are to put it over their mantle of their front door so that when the angel of death comes into the land, it will pass them over and will be gracious towards them and will show them mercy. They are to cook this lamb. They are to cook it without breaking any of its bones. And then... They are to serve with it unleavened bread, the bread of haste. You can't put yeast in this bread. You can't allow it to rise. They don't have time for that because they are on the eve of breaking free. They are on the eve of their deliverance. There won't be any time to let this bread rise. And they are to eat with it bitter herbs to remind them of their slavery. So this meal is to be eaten Every year at the appointed time, in the spring, in the first month on the Jewish calendar, and it is to be lamb and unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Those are its elements. What is its purpose? It is a memorial. They are told to do that every year. They are to remember how God delivered them. They are to remember how he did it, and they are to remember that he did it. And what is the subject of that remembrance? Their deliverance from slavery. Their their deliverance from bondage. That's the meal Jesus is having the night before his death. And this is the meal that he takes. And he uh, uses two elements. He gathers around with the twelve. And he takes the unleavened bread. And he takes a cup of wine. And he tells them the bread is his body that will be broken for them. And he tells them the wine is his blood. The the sign of the new covenant. What is the purpose of all this? Well, Paul tells us right here in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 26. Remember. Just like the old meal, right? Remember. This is a memorial. A remembrance. What is the subject? Well, it's also deliverance. But it's deliverance and to remember the atoning death of the Lamb. The focus here is now on the Lamb, Jesus Christ. So he reminds them in the middle of this little discourse that this is a serious, serious, special moment for the people of God to come together. And to remember that we've been bought at a price. And precious it is. And holy it is. And for them to do it in such a way that brings, look at verse 22. Do you despise the church of God, he says? Do you shame those? He said, you're just bringing shame on what should be one of the most unifying moments in the life of a fellowship. Well, he has quite a rebuke for them. 
And although I know we live in a time when it's pretty common to blame all of our problems on rich people, <laughs> and that's not always true, uh, he does blame and hold accountable for this the upper classes. And he's going to suggest to them that they are going to have to change what they are doing. The who are the different classes, the different economic classes. Listen, the people who are the poor or middle class, they're having to work. I mean, the first day of the week in Corinth was a work day. Not like us, where many of us have Sunday off. This was a work day, which is why they're probably gathering at night and why it's probably the hardest working, poorest among them who aren't getting off in time and are coming either with no food or a very meager basket dinner and arriving late. And they're showing up and everything's eaten and they're, they're halfway done. And Paul is saying to the, he's going to have to say to those who are in the upper classes who come early, get the best seats, have the basket dinner that's the fullest. It's time to rethink what your purpose here is. It's time to rethink why you are doing this. He says, I will not praise you. In verse 22, this is not right. So who is the flashpoint? Well, it's the different economic classes. More specifically, it is the upper class. How have they failed to gather for the Lord's Supper? Uh, that's quite a claim. Look at verse 20. He says, therefore, when you meet together, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. He said, I don't know what you think you're doing. <laughs> He said, I don't know what you think this is, but it has nothing to do with the Lord's Supper. You may call it the Lord's Supper, but you know, you know what the old saying, if it walks like a duck and it sounds like a duck, it's a duck. This isn't the Lord's Supper. You don't have your focus on the selfless sacrifice of the lamb. You yourselves are acting selfishly. How are they failing to make this the Lord's Supper? Will you, as you... Listen to verses 18 through 22. They are being, quite frankly, uns how ironic is it that in a meal that is supposed to mark this selfless sacrifice of the lamb who has bought our salvation, they are acting in a stunningly unselfish way. I mean, excuse me, stunningly selfish way. They are stunningly self-centered. I'm hungry. I got my basket dinner. Not my problem. They're late. We're eating. And that's the way you're going to remember the selflessness of Jesus Christ. He says, this is shameful. This is embarrassing. It's embarrassingly shameful. And there's no love. Jesus Christ's act at Calvary is an act of undeniable love. In fact, it is so undeniable that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's how we know it's loving. We did not deserve it. They're unselfish towards others. They are unloving. It's all about me. It's all about what I want. It's all about what I need. I've got my, I got, I got my dinner ready here in the basket. Not my problem that others don't. This is not the Lord's Supper. Why? Because it bears no resemblance to the purpose and what they're remembering. So who is the target of Paul's rebuke? rebuke? He makes it pretty clear, verse 22, when he says, what? <laughs> uh, he's pretty stunned by this, isn't he? He's pretty taken aback. It's like, what are you doing? <laughs> Do you not have houses in which to eat and drink? Or you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing. See, he's addressing the upper classes. What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? In this, I will not praise you. Yeah, he's expecting them to rethink what they're doing. And they better. Because if they don't, look, what's, look at his assessment in verse 27. You are guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Can you imagine a worse charge? Well, what can they do about this? Well, the good news is he's going to tell them exactly what they should do about this. 
In fact, he tells them three things. They're going to help them rethink how they're doing the Lord's Supper and to rethink its purpose and to rethink what it's supposed to accomplish in terms of unifying them, of being of one mind and one body, one Lord, one baptism, one God, above all. First thing he tells them is that they need to be afraid. He says, you need to be afraid. Verse 29. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick and a number sleep. But if we judged ourselves rightly, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord in order that we may not be condemned along with the world. You know what he's saying to them? If you think God is not watching this, and if you think he will not judge this, you have, you're a fool. Verse 30 is pretty sobering, and it's, in it, it's saying that some are weak, some are sick, and some have died because they have come to this. They have called it the Lord's table when it absolutely bears no resemblance to the Uh, the the selfless sacrifice of Jesus, it bears no resemblance to love and and kindness to one another. And he says, some have died because of this. His first note to them is, you should fear him. Next week when we gather, we should come to this table with a certain degree of fear and trembling. That's healthy. That lets, that's how you know you, you realize what is, what is taking place here. That this is something not to be trifled with. Number two, self-inspection. He says, you need to start examining yourselves. You need to be honest with yourselves. Verse 28, but let a man examine himself and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. He says, listen. It's time for some honest self-examination of where your loyalties lie. What are your priorities? Are you willing to submit? Or are you insisting on the elevation of self? The glorification of self? Are you coming to Christ so that you may serve him and sacrifice for him and take up your cross and follow him? Or are you in it for what's are you coming to it and saying, well, I like to know what's in it for me. Tell me more about those streets of gold that I get to walk on one day. Tell me more about no more tears. I'd like to know more about what's in it for me. At the table where we remember Christ doing the most unselfish act in the history of the world. They want to make it about them. Beloved, that's just kind of sick. They need to do some serious self-examination. And then finally, he gives them one more command. He says, you need to start waiting before you eat. He says, it's time to wait. Verse 33. So then, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. And what he's saying to the older, to the, to the, the, the richer folks that are probably there early and they've got their little basket dinners and they're hungry and they're ready to eat and they're used to eating before the lower classes, it all feels very natural to them. It feels very normal to them. He's saying, you know what? Keep the basket closed until everybody gets there. You're going to wait because you're going to do this together. As a family, because he's he's imagining what's probably going to happen if they wait till everyone arrives. If somebody rushes in from work and nobody's opened their basket yet and they say, yeah, I didn't even have time to go home and cook a thing. Well, hey, you can have some of mine. It's just going to happen naturally. He says, if you won't all gorge yourself before the last person walks in. I mean, it's like the last per, the last poor person walks in who's coming in from work and has nothing to eat. And they come walking in and they, they and everybody's stuffed. <laughs> It's all gone. There's crumbs. It says, if you'll just wait. If you'll just wait. And listen, if you're having trouble waiting, verse 34, why don't you have a snack before you come? If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home. So that you may not come together for judgment. In other words, you won't come together in an unloving way. You'll come together in a way that you have thought ahead of time. You have prepared ahead of time to be family. You've thought about this. You don't just come wandering in. 
Now, I think the it's rare that Paul makes me chuckle. And as a teacher of the Bible, this just makes me laugh. He ends it by saying, and the remaining matters I shall arrange when I come. What's funny about that is go back to verse 18. He says, for in the first place, you know, that usually implies there's a second place, right? He never gets to the second place. <laughs> that is, I, that makes me feel good as a Bible teacher. I've done that a few times. You stand up and say, I got three points and we get through one. <laughs> the people say at the door, they say, I couldn't help but notice you said there were three points. Yeah, wait, come back next week. It's so funny. He says, in the first place, we never get to the second place. And in verse 34, he says, well, I'll tell you about that stuff when I come visit you later. It's just funny. It's already a long letter. And it is. It's a long epistle. It still has chapter 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 to go. He says, yeah, that's going to have to wait. That's kind of, I think that's just kind of makes me chuckle. Yeah, they need to wait on one another. They need to examine their hearts. And they need to do so with fear and trembling. So I'm going to suggest something to you for the week ahead. I'm going to suggest to you that you've got an entire week to spend in examining your heart and preparing for the Lord's Supper next Sunday. I tell you what, I'm guilty of this. I've, I've walked into churches before. And you know, when we do, we do, we do communion with, with the Lord's Supper every first Sunday of the month. And everybody who goes here for a length of time knows that. But how many times have... I walked into a church where I knew the communion schedule and I walk in and when I see the trays up here, I go, oh yeah, it's communion. Today. Oh yeah, Whew, forgot about that. <laughs> Let's don't do that this time. Let's spend the week and I'll, I'll suggest a couple of things. I Listen, going and just reading Matt, one day read Matthew 26, Matthew's account of the Last Supper. And maybe the next day, go one step further and read Matthew's account of the crucifixion. Do the same with Mark chapter 14 the next day. Luke chapter 22, maybe a day after that. Spend some time in examining your heart for unrepentant sin. Rather than treating it sort of like it's a New Year's resolution. Oh yeah, it's communion today. Oh yeah, this sin is just dogging me and it's still mastering me. So today I'm going to resolve here before I take communion that I'm really going to repent from that. Let's don't do it. Let's repent today. So that when we arrive next Sunday, it's a celebration of the repentance and the liberty and the freedom we have from sin. Make it a Make it a focus of prayer and reflection and Bible reading every day this week so that when we arrive, we're not engaged in this sort of unworthy, oh, yeah, it's communion. Oh, yeah, I better, better, maybe I should say, maybe I should say a special prayer. Uh, maybe I should, okay, I gotta, I gotta get, get focused. Yeah, let's, let's get focused today and spend the week Preparing our hearts through examination with fear and trembling, repentance, confession, repentance, time in not just these accounts in Matthew and Mark and Luke, but you can come back and read 1 Corinthians chapter 11 again and arrive being a people of one mind and one purpose and one objective to gather around that table to the glory of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Well, Lord, I thank you so much for this, this really challenging epistle from the apostle. We are certainly convicted of its challenges. And we are certainly wary, wary of doing anything that would bring shame to your name or dishonor to your kingdom. And so this week we are going to pray. We're going to pray and we're going to examine our hearts, but we're going to pray like King David prayed. And we're going to pray and ask that you might examine us. And if there is anything in us that is lacking, bring it to our attention. Help us to see it, that we might repent from it and go forth and sin no more. And as we come together around the Lord's table next Sunday, help us to do so as a people with one mind 
and one heart and one objective. And that is to declare Christ and Him crucified. The whole meal preaches Christ and Him crucified. We don't want to get in the way of that message next week. But we want to revel in it. Because that is the atonement for our sin. It is the sacrifice. It is the lamb that soothed God's anger towards us. And because of that, we are saved. So help us to celebrate that, not just next Sunday at 1030. Help us to celebrate all this week so that we might look forward to that with anticipation and expectation. And we pray this humbly in Jesus' name. Amen.